Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Derek Kane, and today we're going to talk about association rules, or in the business world, these are commonly referred to as market basket analysis. This tutorial is one tutorial in a broader series of lectures diving into topics of machine learning, data science, and predictive analytics. If you're interested in this tutorial, I'd recommend checking out the other tutorials as well. Thank you very much, and let's begin. The overview of topics that we're going to go over today include an introduction to association rules, basic terminology that we need to understand in order to interpret association rules. We'll talk a little bit about the a priori algorithm, and then we'll dive into some practical examples, including a grocery shopping basket analysis, and then a voting pattern in the House of Representatives example. Well, what are association rules? Association rules are a series of methodologies for discovering interesting relationships between variables in a database. The outcome of this technique, in simple terms, is a set of rules that can be understood as if this, then that. An example of an association rule would be if a person buys peanut butter and bread, then they will also purchase jelly. There are many applications of association rules. Most notably in a business setting would be a product recommendation engine. In digital media recommendations, so for the company Netflix. In politics, there's applications in medical diagnosis. In content optimization, bioinformatics, web mining, and scientific data analysis. An example is the analysis of Earth science data may reveal interesting connections among the ocean, land, and atmospheric processes. This understanding may help scientists to better articulate how these systems interact with one another. An example of an association rule is maybe people who buy flour and casting sugar also tend to buy eggs because a high proportion of them are planning on baking a cake. A retailer can use this information to inform the store layout, putting products that co-occur together close to one another to improve the customer shopping experience. Marketing, target customers who buy flour with offers on eggs to encourage them to spend more on their shopping basket. Retailers can use these type of rules to identify new opportunities for cross-selling and upselling their products to their customers. And association rules are a very powerful machine learning technique that has numerous business applications. As we can see here, just by understanding the relationships of products and how they're being sold together, uh, that understanding allows for store layouts, marketing, and cross-selling opportunities just through a simple data mining technique. I would like to take a moment and talk about the company Netflix. Netflix asked engineers and scientists around the world to solve what seems like a very simple problem. Improve Netflix's ability to predict what movies users would like by a modest 10%. From 5 million revenue in 1999, Netflix reached 3.2 billion revenue in 2011 as a result of becoming an analytics competitor. And by analyzing customer behavior and buying patterns, they created a recommendation engine which optimizes both customer taste and inventory condition. And that question that they had posed to the engineers and data scientists around the world, really at the heart of it is an association rule. It's a market basket analysis. So understanding customers at a very granular level and being able to say based off of their interests, what are certain movies that they would like to watch and make those recommendations front and center. Now how Netflix actually goes about creating this algorithm is a little more complex. I mean, they use some classification and some clustering techniques on top. But what's interesting, especially in, in the context of this discussion, is the root of it is association rules. So just mastering this basic tech data mining technique 
I think it becomes a very potent weapon in your arsenal. Before we really dive into association rules, there is some basic terminology and mathematics that we have to understand in order to get the most out of the experience. Okay, so whenever we see a, a, a rule that is generated from this analysis, it typically looks like this format. So we have a bracket, and then we have some conditions that fall within the bracket. And then we have what looks like equal sign and a less than sign, or oh, I'm sorry, a greater than sign, but it's really just an arrow that's pointing to the right hand side, which is a, a resulting decision rule. Okay, and so we call the left hand side of this arrow uh, LHS, and then the right hand side RHS. And the statement can be read as, if a user buys an item in the item set on the left hand side, then the user will likely buy the item on the right-hand side, too. Good. So the notation is fairly straightforward, but it's important to understand because most machine learning techniques will, will describe the rules in this manner. And I think an easier way to understand it is, in this example, where we're saying a person who buys coffee and sugar, then they're likely to buy milk. Before we can really dive in to the association rules, we have to understand three important ratios or metrics. In this case, they're called the support, the confidence, and the lift. And in the upcoming slides, we'll dive into each one of these topics in detail. But for now, the support is just the fraction of which our item set occurs in our data set. The confidence is the probability that a rule is correct for a new transaction with items on the left. And lift is the ratio by which the confidence of a rule exceeds the expected confidence. So now that we have an understanding of these three key metrics, let's dive into them uh, in a little more detail. First, we'll start with the support. The support of an item or item set is the fraction of transactions in our data set that contain that item or item set. So let's talk about this a little more. For example, if a grocer has 15 transactions in total, so 15 receipts, of which peanut butter, if a person who buys peanut butter also buys jelly, appears six times. The support for this rule is we take the six instances in which this occurs divided by the total number of transactions, or 0.40. In general, it's nice to identify rules that have a high support, as these will be applicable to a large number of transactions. So when we're looking at association rules, we have to understand the level of granularity that we're working with, within. If we're going uh, at a very customer-specific point, well, then you're going to have lower supports. But if we're looking at grocery store consumers as a whole, we want to look at higher supports. Support is an important measure because a rule that has low support may occur simply by chance. A low support rule may also be uninteresting from a business perspective because it might not be profitable to promote items that are seldom bought together. For these reasons, support is often used to eliminate uninteresting rules. And we do this by establishing a certain threshold or criteria when we get our resulting uh, rule set. For supermarket retailers, this is likely to involve basic products that are popular across the entire user base, bread, milk, because when people go to a grocery store, these are staple items that they're going to be buying anyway, so of course you're going to see connections to, to other products. A printer cartridge retailer, for example, may not have products with a high support because each customer only buys cartridges that are specific to his or her own printer. And this is an important concept because we have to look at the business application when we're applying these rules and that we can't just have a steadfast rule that works for all. I mean we have to look at the market conditions and really set up uh, parameters that make sense from a business perspective. Now we'll talk a little bit about the confidence measure. 
The confidence of a rule is the likelihood that it is true for a new transaction that contains the items on the left-hand side of the rule. For example, it's the probability that the transaction also contains the items on the right-hand side. Now, formally, we can write this as the confidence of x to y is equal to the support x union y divided by the support of x. In layman's terms, it's the confidence of buying peanut butter and jelly. In this case, we see it 0 0.26 times divided by our support of 0 0.40, which gives us 0 0.65. And what this means is that for 65% of the transactions that contain peanut butter and jelly, the rule is correct. Confidence measures the reliability of the inference made by a given rule. For a given rule x to y, the higher the confidence, the more likely it is for y to be present in transactions that contain x. Association analysis results should be interpreted with caution. The inference made by an association rule does not necessarily imply causality. Instead, it suggests a strong co-occurrence relationship between the items and the antecedent and consequent of the rule. And this is important because when we talked about our support measure just a moment ago, we have to calibrate it to the business process. But that also comes down to the confidence of the rule as well. In general, we want confidence um, that is stronger. And stronger is a relative term in this case. So depending on the business relationship and the level of granularity, we have to also um, calibrate our confidence as well. The final ratio we'll talk about is called the lift. And the lift of a rule is a ratio of the support of the items on the left-hand side and the rule co-occurring with items on the right-hand side divided by the probability that the left-hand side and right-hand side co-occur if the two are independent. I know that's kind of a mouthful, and we'll walk into an example of really what this lift is showing. So the lift of a particular rule of x to y is essentially the support x union y divided by the support y times the support of x. So in our example of the lift of a peanut butter to jelly rule, we have 0 0.26 divided by the support of y, which is 0 0.46, times the support of x, which is 0 0.40. And in this case, we get a value of 1.4. If the lift is greater than 1, it suggests that the presence of the items on the left-hand side has increased the probability that the items on the right-hand side will occur in this transaction. If the lift is below 1, it suggests that the presence of the items on the left-hand side make the probability that the items on the right-hand side will be part of the transaction lower. If the, list is, if the lift is 1, it indicates that the items on the left and right are independent. And essentially, what we are looking for is we're looking for transactions that have a lift greater than 1. And the ratio, the higher the better. Okay, because those are the ones that are telling us these are rules that we're seeing increase the probability in which the right-hand side of the rule will be purchased. Okay, so when we're evaluating this metric, we want to be looking for lifts greater than 1. And on top of that, we also want to ensure that our support and confidence uh, is high as well. So when we're looking at rules and trying to weed out which ones make sense, we're looking for higher support, reasonable confidence, preferably higher, of course, and lift ratios greater than one. The higher, the better. Now that we've talked about the metrics for evaluating uh, association rules, let's dive into an algorithm, and most notably the a priori algorithm. This algorithm is perhaps the best known algorithm for mining of association rules. And the a priori theorem is if an item set is frequent, then all of its subsets must also be frequent. This algorithm uses a breadth-first strategy to count the support of item sets and uses a candidate generation function where it exploits the downward closure property of support 
which is an anti monotonicity. The approach essentially follows a two step process. First, the minimum support is applied to find all frequent item sets in the database. Second, these frequent item sets and the minimum confidence constraint are used to form the rules. Well, what is this frequent item set that we're talking about? Well, finding the frequent item sets in a database is difficult since it involves searching over all item combinations. The set of possible item combinations is the power set over one and has the size of two to n minus one. So as, as the number of products in this case grows, the amount of frequent item sets that have to be calculated grows exponentially. And this poses a very real problem uh, for computing and generating these rule sets. As we can see here, at the top, we're looking at no decision rules. Then if you go down to the first layer, we have five products, A, B, C, D, E. Then the second layer essentially is looking for any type of combinations of the products, A and B, A and C, A and D, A and E, so on and so forth. And it covers all two level combinations. Well, if you go deeper than the two level combinations to three uh, item combinations, we find that it even gets more complex, and then it goes down to the four level combination, and finally to the bottom that uh, contains all of the items. So it searches through all of these combinations to find the most frequent item set. Well, the downward closure property of support allows for an efficient search and it guarantees that for a frequent item set, all of its subsets are also frequent. And that's an important statement, okay? So if I have a frequent item set, all of its subsets are also frequent. We'll talk about that in a moment. And additionally, for an infrequent item set, all of its supersets must also be infrequent. And these properties allow for us to kind of cut some corners in, in a computational sense when the algorithm is calculating. So for instance, if I know that the item set CDE is frequent and appears often, then I also know just um, through this property that the subsets are also frequent. So CD, CE, DE, CDE, and the null. Additionally, if I know that AB is an infrequent item set, then I, own, uh, then I know that the supersets that are a result of AB are also going to be infrequent. Now let's spend some time and go through a practical example that's going to use the a priori algorithm in this case, we're going to uh, evaluate a grocery store. Imagine, if you will, you have 10,000 receipts sitting in front of you on your table. Each receipt, and these are just grocery store receipts, and each receipt represents a transaction with items that were purchased. And this receipt is a representation of stuff that went into a customer's basket, and therefore it's called a market basket analysis. So when I go to the grocery store and I'm filling up my cart with all of my goods, that's really my market basket in this case. And the receipt is the record of the transaction of all the items that were purchased. And that's exactly what this data set contains. Okay, and it, it's just, it contains a collection of receipts with each line representing one receipt and the items purchased. Each line is called a transaction in each column in a row represents an item that was bought. For each transaction, there can only be distinct items without repeating entries. This allows for us to create a binary zero or one representation whether a particular item was purchased under a specific transaction. And that's important because some, some approaches to this analysis might be looking at, well, he bought five candy bars, and you know they consider that into the equation here. 
In this case, we just want to know that did they or did they not purchase a candy bar? Okay, so it's a it's more stripped down example, but it's really for us to understand the mechanics of how this algorithm is working. Okay, and we can think of it like this in terms of a data set. So each transaction is a receipt, okay, and each item is an item that is purchased. So in in my example on the bottom, my receipt is called A0001, and in this particular receipt, the person had bought citrus fruit, margarine, ready soups, and semi-finished bread. A second transaction, uh, A0002, shows a different customer purchasing coffee and tropical fruit. Okay, but this is how the data comes in and when you look in business intelligence systems and the way that you're going to be interacting with data, this is probably the format you're going to see it. So the question is, well, okay, how do we get this into data that makes more sense? In order to do this, what we need to do is we actually need to pivot or we actually need to flip the data across the horizontal axis into a cross tabulation. And when we do this, notice that the items are now the column headings. Okay. And this preparation is critical because it ensures that the data can then be read properly into the a priori marked basket algorithm. So I'm taking my data set, in this case, all of my transactions, and I just made it very simple to show A, B, C, you know, etc., etc., and then the items on the right hand side. When we do this flip, Notice that the transactions are one per line in this instance, but the items X, Y, Z that we see in our previous data set go across as columns. And when we look at a spreadsheet in this case, there can be an incredible amount of columns depending on the retail that we're looking at. You know, a supermarket may contain 10,000 different items on their shelves. So it is feasible that we could have spreadsheets that have 10,000 columns. Once we have that, we need to make sure that we have a binary representation of the data. So in this case, when we have flipped the data uh, or used our cross tabulation to flip the items across the horizontal into the columns, we now see that we have each transaction representing a row on this database. And did the item appear in uh, in the receipt? If it's a yes, give it a one. Otherwise, give it a zero. And this preparation is is critical in getting the data ready for uh, for our market rule, our market basket analysis and association rule creation. When we run this algorithm in R, it requires that we have to set a threshold for detecting patterns in the data set. So however we set these thresholds is of importance. And for our example, we specified a support value of 0.001. And we talked about the support being, we want it to be a higher figure. Okay. And in this case, well, support of 001, I mean, that's just a fraction of the 10,000 receipts that we have. Why would we go for so low? And it's because for this particular business, we have a very high volume of receipts and a very large product offering. Okay, so there's just going to be a lot of random noise in there. And I wanted to make sure that what we're getting shows support of what we see in the data. And in addition, we specified a confidence level of 0 0.70. So we gave a stronger confidence level, and then we tweaked the parameter to allow for a lower support. And I think if you are working with this type of data and you change the support to a very higher, high threshold, let's say, you know, 10 or 20 or 30%, you're gonna find that uh, you're not gonna get a whole lot of rules created. So this is the example that I was talking about with the business. And additionally, we set the length of the rule to not exceed three elements. Okay, and 
The reason for that is I just wanted to show two products on the left hand side resulting in one product on the right hand side. Otherwise we could have rules with you know four or five different products all being bundled together leading to uh, leading to a specific product and for simplicity purposes we decided to prune that down. Now notice in this example before before we move on, notice the lift values. They're all very high. In particular, we have uh, one that has a lift of 11.24. The others have you know, somewhere in the three to four ranges. And this is important, as we had mentioned earlier, having lifts that are greater than one are important in ascertaining whether or not you know, uh, the rule makes business sense. I want to talk a little bit about tuning these algorithm parameters as well. Okay, because different businesses have the distribution of items by transaction that look very different. So very different support and confidence parameters may be applicable. This comes down to what we were talking about earlier about the nature of the business and you know uh, making adjustments to the parameters to suit the business needs. And to determine what works best, you need to experiment with it. Start with a very high support, a very high confidence level, and see what type of rules you're generating. And then try a much lower one. You get a very significant amount of rules. And if so, you know, begin you know, the process of calibrating and understanding how your business works. Once you have the rules, you have to sift through them carefully identify those which are more impactful to your business. You'll see it with lots of products, a number of rules that come out, but just taking the ones that have the highest lift isn't the best solution. You need to go through and say, oh, okay, from a business standpoint, does this make sense? You know, work with the product management and the sales group to say, these are the rules that we've come up with. Do we have something that we can work here? And I think by doing so, you'll find uh, that you'll be bringing more people into the business process and they'll have more buy-in on your analytics. And there really, there is no steadfast rule on where to begin. So experiment with loose parameters and just go from there. To showcase how we can leverage this insight further, let's focus in on three specific items of interest. So we created a series of uh, association rules just across the entire threshold of receipts. So we took our 10,000 receipts and we said, okay, let's just give us uh, the rules that we found. But many times in a business setting, we're going to want to focus on very specific products. So I want to show you that we can, in fact, take the algorithm and just work on products that we know that we want to understand the relationship. In this case, we're going to look at these three products here, yogurt, tropical fruit, and bottled beer. We can run the algorithm with the same thresholds and tuning parameters and specify that these terms are to be used as the criterion for the right-hand side of the rule set generation. So in this case, I want to understand the relationship of products that people are buying uh, in addition to this product. And this could be for bundling or creating cross-promotional opportunities. Or, as we had spoke about earlier, uh, understanding where the co-occurrence happens. Maybe we can redesign the displays and bring some of these products to physically sit next to each other. But here is, here is a group that we had found that really just contained yogurt, tropical fruit, and bottled beer. And it's corresponding lift, confidence, and support. Now, we can also use this as criterion for the left-hand side of the rule set generation. So we're saying, okay, if people are buying yogurt, what are some of the other products that they're buying with this? In this case, if you buy yogurt, you're buying whole milk, which I'm not surprised with. If you're buying yogurt, you're buying rolls and buns. If you're buying powdered beer, you're also buying soda, so on and so forth. 
So we can take products and run it through this, uh, this a priori algorithm and generate rule sets in many different ways. And, that, and that's really where the, the power of this uh, algorithm comes into play. So how do we use this analysis for business decisions? We talked a little bit about it before, but let's, let's talk about it again. Okay. Before we use the data to make any kind of business decision, it is really important that we take a step back and remember something really important. The output of the analysis reflects how frequently items co-occur in transactions. Okay, and this is a function both of the strength of the association between the items and the way that the business has presented them to the customer. What this means is if we're actively trying to cross-promote two products to be bought with each other and we have a marketing campaign that shows us, we're going to see it in the resulting data. And then therefore our association rules are going to have greater strength of it's going to have higher support, higher confidence and higher lifts as a result of the way that we've actively uh, shaped our business. So we can actually use this as a means to kind of back into the success of you know, certain types of cross-promotional activities, but we need to understand this when we're looking at these resulting rule sets. And to say this in a different way, items might co-occur not because they are naturally connected, but because we people in charge of an organization have presented them together. And just remember this when you're when you're working with association rules. The market basket results can be used to drive targeted marketing campaigns. For each patron, we pick a handful of products based on the products that they have bought to date, which have both have a high uplift and a high margin. And then what we do is we send them a personalized email or display ads, etc. How we use the analysis has significant implications for the analysis itself. If we are feeding the analysis into a machine-driven process for delivering recommendations, we are much more interested in generating an expansive set of rules. Okay, so if we're just going to do some targeted snail mail marketing ads, well, we're going to prune down these rules to just the most important ones. However, if I'm at Amazon.com and I'm looking at people who bought this also want to buy this, I'm going to have the largest set of rules readily available because I want to dynamically present them. And that's important. If we are experimenting with targeted marketing for the first time, it makes much more sense to just pick a handful of particularly high value rules and action just on them before working out whether to invest in the effort of building out the capability to manage a much wider and more complicated rule set. So you can use this algorithm immediately for, for business purposes. And people instantly talk about you know having it at the web, having all these dynamic, you know, um, you know, customer-centric targeted marketing. But first, get in the hang of using the rules to generate uh, business outcomes that are measurable. Once you have that, then you can build the infrastructure and expand upon it. Now, there are actually a number of ways we can use the data to drive site organization. So we've been talking in business context in terms of brick and mortar for most of our lectures here. But I want to talk a little bit about web-based marketing. So when we're looking at co-occurring items and how that they're placed on a web page when people are shopping, we can actually take large clusters of these co-occurring items and put them in their own category or theme. Okay. Item pairs that commonly co-occur should be placed close together within broad categories on the website. And this is especially important when one item in a pair is very popular and the other item is a very high margin. And this is critical to understand because just by being close to each other, there is a chance that people, when they're choosing the popular item, will also choose this high profit item for your organization if they are complementary type products. So if you're going to run a sale on one, put the other one next to it. 
and you never know. Long lists of rules, including ones with low support and confidence, can be put can be used to put recommendations at the bottom of product pages and on product card pages. The only thing that matters for these rules is that the lift is greater than one, and that we pick those rules that are applicable for each product with a high lift where the product recommended has a high margin. And this is really the, the absolute basics that we can do here. But setting the threshold of having a lift greater than one is moving in the right direction. But when we're trying to personalize the experience more, then we obviously have to go deeper and look more at similar types of products for similar uh, types of customers. But in general, if you want to get started on this, that's one threshold that is a very effective one to begin. And in the event that doing the above three points drives significant uplift in profit, it would strengthen the case to invest in a recommendation system. And this recommendation system uses a similar algorithm in an operational context to power the automatic recommendation on our website. It's using the exact same algorithm, uh, it's the same nuts and bolts, it's just we're automating it and we're building it as part of our business process. Now that we've talked about the grocery store and in business context, I want to show you that you can actually use association rule in a political sense. So it's, it's not just limited to uh, physical transactions, but any type of data sets that we want to look at. We will apply the results of association analysis to the voting records of members of the United States House of Representatives. This data set is obtained from the 1984 Congressional Voting Records Database, which is a data set that is publicly available in the UCI Machine Learning Data Repository. Before we look into this, I just want to take a look at the way that the data set is laid out, because this is kind of an interesting aspect. So we have 17 columns of information. In the first column is the class name, in this case, it's Democrat or Republican. Items 2 to 17 represent the different issues and what the voting record was. Okay, So these are all bills that are going into the House of Representatives and whether or not they voted yes or no on these issues. So they're all dichotomous, zero or ones, yes, no. But this data set itself looks very different than our transactional one that we were working through earlier. And we have to reshape and work with the data to get it set up um, for this association rule analysis. And I'll get into that uh, in discussions about the actual R language itself. Okay. But for now, just understand that you can take a data set that looks like this and get it set up um, for market basket analysis. after we've ran the algorithm and set certain uh, threshold parameters, here is a result of some of the rules that have generated. And as we can see, uh, some interesting ideas are now coming out. One observation is that a vote in favor of the physician pay freeze indicates a Republican with 95% confidence. Okay. A vote against indicates a Democrat with 99% confidence. The voting patterns are relatively clear in this example with a high degree of support and confidence. We can see which party favors a specific law without knowing the contents of the legislation itself. So imagine how we can use this information in other aspects of intelligence gathering or in other types of business context. So just by looking at the data and transforming it and running it through the a priori algorithm, there are all sorts of wonderful insights that we can gain, not just in the business context, but here in, the, in a political sense as well. Thank you very much everyone for tuning in. I enjoyed uh, going through this presentation with you. And as always, um, please continue to go through the tutorials, subscribe to the channel, and I hope this uh, offers some help. Thank you.